Nicaragua's Foreign Minister Dennis Moncada announced the country's withdrawal from the Organization of American States. The judicial branch in Peru has sentenced former presidential advisor Vladimiro Montesinos to 17 years in prison for the kidnapping of journalist Gustavo Goriti and others during Alberto Fujimori's dictatorship. Nigeria's National Primary Health Care Development Agency plans to vaccinate 50% of the population against COVID-19 by January 2022. From the headquarters of Teleso English in Havana, Cuba, this is from the South, I'm Katrina Goss. Nicaraguan Foreign Minister Denis Moncada addressed the interventionist acts of the Organization of American States and Managua's official withdrawal from the organization on national television. The country's top diplomat announced the move after the National Assembly called on President Daniel Ortega to denounce and withdraw from the organization, a decision supported by the Supreme Court. Moncada underlined that Nicaragua chooses to follow its democratic path without the pressures of foreign influences following the meddling of the OAS Secretary General, Luis Almagro, at the service of the United States government, who sought to undermine Nicaragua's democratic system and recent election results. The foreign minister stressed that the electoral process in Nicaragua was carried out in accordance with the law and peacefully, and that the Secretary General of the OAS had abused his authority on acting in the name of another country's interests. Following instructions from the President of the Republic, Commander Daniel Ortega Saavedra, we inform you, the people of Nicaragua and the international community, that today, Friday, November 19th, at 8 a.m., we sent to the Secretary General of the Organization of American States the statement denouncing the Organization of American States Charter. We are resigning and disassociating ourselves from that organization, ending the relationship between the Nicaraguan state and the OAS. On his Twitter account, Cuban Foreign Minister Bruno Rodriguez expressed his support for Nicaragua's decision to withdraw from the Organization of American States. In his message, Cuba's top diplomat said it's a firm and dignified response to the maneuvers of the Secretary General of the Organization in collusion with the United States to try to interfere in decisions that only concern the Nicaraguan people. Ecuador's president, Guillermo Lasso, extended by 30 days the country's state of emergency declared on October 18th in nine provinces, which have seen major anti-government mobilizations. The presidency stated the purpose of the declaration is to protect the rights of the people and to control the security situation in areas linked to drug trafficking, as well as to restore peaceful coexistence and public order. Of the 24 provinces of Ecuador, the head of state decided to renew the state of emergency in nine of them, El Oro, Guardas, Santa Elena, Manabi, Los Rios, Esmeraldas, Santo Domingo, Pinchi, Chincha and Sucumbios. On the basis of this measure, the Federal Armed Forces and the State Police are authorized, among other things, to carry out gun controls, inspections, patrols around the clock and drug seizures. Social movements have denounced the militarization of the country and the repression of protesters. The debate in Colombia for the total decriminalization of abortion, on which the Constitutional Court was expected to rule this Thursday, continues without being resolved. The plenary chamber had to decide whether to maintain or separate from the debate one of the nine magistrates in charge of issuing the ruling, but the vote was tied. With four votes in favor and four against, the tiebreaker has now been left to the assistant judge, Hernando Yepes Arcila, who will have to decide whether magistrate Alexander Linares will continue to be part of the discussion on the voluntary interruption of pregnancy. According to sources close to the Constitutional Court, his decision could take a week or two. The discussion around Linares came after a challenge presented to the plenary chamber by lawyer Ana Maria Indarraga in the framework of statements by the magistrate, in which she accuses him of publicly expressing his position on the issue of abortion. Because of the challenge, Linares this week declared himself unable to participate in the debate and left it up to his colleagues to assess whether they will accept his impediment or not. Venezuela is ready to hold its regional municipal elections this Sunday, November 21st, a process accompanied by over 300 international observers, including a delegation sent by the European Union, the first since 2006. Our correspondent Brian Mir brings us more details. I'm standing in the command center for this Sunday's 
Venezuelan regional elections. As part of the government's Plan Republica program, over 350,000 members of the armed forces are working to guarantee the integrity of the elections. Now the Venezuelan armed forces are going to transport the voting machines to over 14,000 voting centers across the country. They're going to guarantee their security during the electoral process and they're going to remove the voting machines and bring them back to the tallying centers after the elections are done this Sunday. In all, over 70,000 candidates are running for 3,082 public offices this Sunday, including 96% representing opposition parties. The government is doing everything it can to guarantee the integrity, not only of the candidates, but of the elector, electorate, and of the over 300 international observers who are coming from 55 countries in four different delegations, including the Carter Center and the European Union, which is back monitoring elections in Venezuela for the first time since 2006. Thursday saw the close of campaign events ahead of Chile's general elections to be held on Sunday. Far-right presidential candidate Jose Antonio Cos conducted an aggressive closing rally in which he paid tribute to former dictator Augusto Pinochet. The pre-election silence began this Friday and will last until Sunday when the first round of the presidential elections will take place, for many the most polarized presidential election in the country's history. The closing rallies of each of the seven candidates have been in tune with the political moment that Chile is experiencing. There were massive rallies, small events in squares and towns, and even an early morning planting of paper mills in what was the epicenter of the 2019 anti-government protests. The candidates leading the polls come from very different political backgrounds. Jose Antonio Cast on the right, the far right, and Gabriel Boric, the country's youngest ever presidential challenger, to the left. They're competing against five other candidates and will surely come head to head again for the second round on December 19th. And we'll be right back after this very short break. Don't go away. Welcome back to From the South. The judicial branch in Peru has sentenced former presidential advisor Vladimiro Montesinos to 17 years in prison for the kidnapping of journalist Gustavo Goriti and others, which occurred in 1992 after the coup perpetrated by former dictator Alberto Fujimori. Similarly, retired General Jose Rolando Valdivia Duenas was sentenced to 12 years in prison, while former Generals Julio Salazar Monroe and Alfredo Arnaiz Ambrosiani were each sentenced to 10 years in prison after being recognized as the main accomplices in the crime. As reparation, the court ordered the payment of $137,000 that will have to be paid to Corrite and the other victims. Montesinos is serving sentences for crimes of corruption, usurpation of public office, money laundering, kidnapping, conspiracy, arms trafficking, aggravated homicide and enforced disappearance. This Thursday, a request made by a group of Bolivian lawyers against Romulo Calvo, president of the far-right Pro Santa Cruz Civic Committee, revealed that the leader, who has also been accused of participating in the 2019 coup and in recent acts of violence, has been involved in 35 legal processes. Lawyers promoting the trial against Romulo Calvo stated that they have information that he could seek to flee the country and will therefore request an arrest warrant. They also stated that they are trying to avoid a new coup attempt in Bolivia. Calvo has promoted the indefinite strike action in Santa Cruz against the government of President Luis Arce. He was one of the most violent instigators of the 2019 coup against President Evo Morales, calling for Morales' indigenous supporters to be attacked. Bolivian Minister of Justice Ivan Lima confirmed that the Civic Committee leader has 35 lawsuits filed against him, several of them filed by the former mayor of Santa Cruz, Percy Fernandez, one of his former allies. <coughs> This former mayor of Santa Cruz, this former councilman, has more than 35 processes. There are many corruption scandals in which he is involved, not presented by the socialist movements, but by the former mayor of Santa Cruz, Percy Fernandez, some of them with accusations. In this context, Calvo's political allies claimed he was the victim of political persecution, as expressed by the lawmaker of the Creemos Alliance, Maria René Álvarez. There is a manipulation of justice on the part of the government, which evidently seeks to silence anyone who thinks differently from the socialist movement. What is happening with the moral president of all the Cruzanos, the president of the pro-Santa Cruz committee, is a persecution and intimidation. 
Bolivian Minister of Government Eduardo del Castillo responded to the accusations of supporters of the Romulo of Romulo Calvo, who claimed that the executive branch is conducting political persecution against the far-right leader. In November 2019, we are no longer leaving the 2020 administration. Mr. Añez does not govern here, and there is no political persecution in our country. Here, there is a government democratically elected by all the Bolivian people with more than 55 percent. We have always guaranteed the right to protest and freedom of expression of each and every Bolivian citizen. However, we will not tolerate that crimes are committed in our country. There have been some people who have allegedly committed crimes promoted by Mr. Romulo Calvo by doing actions or by different omissions. We are analyzing each of these facts, the actions taken by Mr. Calvo during the days of the civic strike that has generated the damage to all Bolivian families, and we will see what his actions have been. If we find some elements for the commission of alleged crimes, the Ministry of Government will be present in the correspondent processes. Former Brazilian President Luis Ignacio Lula Silva secured another legal victory following the decision of a Sao Paulo court to close the investigation against three of his sons. On Thursday, the Justice Court of Sao Paulo accepted the request of the Public Prosecutor's Office and closed the investigation into Fabio Luis, Marcos Claudio and Sandro Luis Lula de Silva. The decision was based on the complete lack of evidence causing the magistrate to annul the investigation that sought to uncover links between Lula's relatives and the now infamous Lava Jato operation. Lula was held in prison for 580 days until his release in March this year when a federal Supreme Court judge overturned his convictions, meaning he could now run for the presidency again in 2022. Addressing the Eurasian Intergovernmental Council, Cuban Prime Minister Manuel Marrero denounced the tightening of the U.S. blockade against his country. The event, hosted by Armenia, brought together the prime ministers of the host country, Russia, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and the chairman of the board of the Eurasian Economic Commission. Moldova and Uzbekistan, like Cuba, participated as observer states. The Cuban PM highlighted the organization's integration and development and stressed the importance of expanding and strengthening exchanges in key areas for mutual benefit, especially in the face of the challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic and Western sanctions. Member states of the Council also expressed their condemnation of the U.S. blockade policy and its harmful effects on the Cuban population. This Thursday, the Russian government delivered a donation of over 600 tons of vegetable oil to the Cuban people through the United Nations World Food Program. Russian ambassador to Cuba, Andrei Guskov, pointed out that this action responds to the ties of friendship that have united both countries for many years. The head of the World Food Programme in the Caribbean nation, Paolo Matei, informed that the donation will benefit more than 70,000 elderly people through the family care system. Cuba's Deputy Minister of Foreign Trade and Investment, Deborah Rivas, thanked Russia for its support and confirmed that the oil will be redistributed free of charge. The donation comes as Cuba suffers shortages of key foodstuffs due to the tightened U.S. blockade policy, aggravated by the COVID-19 pandemic. This support to the friendly Cuban people is very important, both in the conditions of the COVID-19 pandemic and in the situation aggravated by the unprecedented reinforcement of the economic, commercial and financial blockade imposed by the United States against the island. In this complex scenario, Russia's assistance to the sustainable development of the largest of the Antilles is being increased within the framework of international organizations. We have really received invaluable help from Russia. We take this opportunity to thank also the World Food Program for its contribution in a sustained and systematic way to advance in this contribution to the national program that we have made to fight COVID and that has really been an invaluable help to the most sensitive and vulnerable people as well. And we have more stories coming up after this final short break. Stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. 
Nigeria's National Primary Healthcare Development Agency plans to vaccinate 50% of the population against COVID-19 by January 2022. The executive director of the agency revealed that Nigeria has received over 100 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines from COVAX, the African Union and some other countries, which would be sufficient to ramp up vaccination for 50% of the targeted population. Eligible persons for COVID-19 vaccination are those aged 18 years and above. The agency also added that over 3,000 health facilities nationwide will be involved in the process. The government is also making efforts to engage key players, including religious leaders and civil society organisations, to increase the number of people getting vaccinated. I waited this long to take the vaccination because I wanted to be sure of which to take. So after my analysis and um, news and messages from across the world, so I decided to take the vaccine today. So my family, they've all taken, my colleagues have all taken. So I'm advising Nigerians to take the vaccine so that we can get to herd immunity and we can go back to our normal lives again. The Austrian Chancellor announced on Friday that the government will impose a lockdown and make vaccinations mandatory. The decision makes Austria the first country in the European Union to adopt such strict measures as coronavirus cases spiral. Health authorities inform that compulsory vaccination will start from February 2022 for all residents of the country. They said they've been forced to make, take action on COVID-19 as the country's infection rate is among the highest on the continent. The Chancellor called on citizens to act responsibly and with awareness in following the stipulated measures. Starting Monday, for a maximum of 20 days, a nationwide lockdown will apply, which after 10 days will be revaluated and will end automatically not later than December 13th. From this date onwards, no lockdown will apply for vaccinated and recovered persons. Vietnam is making the final preparations ahead of Saturday's reopening of tourism activities. After a two-year halt due to COVID-19, around 200 South Korean visitors are set to arrive on the holiday island of Phu Quoc after a vaccine passport scheme kicked off this month. We believe that with this safe and exciting journey for the first group of foreign tourists to Phu Quoc after lockdown, it will become an ideal model for millions of tourists wishing to come to Phu Quoc to experience the upcoming festive season, which contributes to reviving the tourism sector of Vietnam. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi announced on my Friday that the controversial agricultural laws approved last year will be repealed, marking a major victory for the country's farmers who staged mass mobilizations against the legislation for the past year. People celebrated in the streets of India in what was described as a triumph for the workers of the land who for a year stood their ground despite repression against the laws that sought to put the fate of Indian agriculture in private hands, threatening their livelihoods. The Prime Minister acknowledged that he could not convince a large sector of farmers and rural workers of the benefits of the laws. Some analysts, surprised by the decision, especially given Modi's majority support in Parliament, noted that the scheduled protests and the proximity to regional elections could have favoured the farmers with leverage. The constitutional repeal of the free laws will be completed by the end of this month. The Syrian government reiterated that the situation of displaced people and refugees is still a national priority and that work is ongoing with Russia to guarantee the return of Syrian citizens to their homes. In a statement, the government ratified its collaboration with Russia in this field following the recently held joint meeting of the Syrian-Russian Ministerial Coordination Committees on the return of Syrian refugees in Damascus. Syrian authorities also expressed their gratitude to Russia for its efforts and the will to continue working on re-establishing security and infrastructure across the nation. They also denounced the criminal destabilizing acts of the West, including financing terrorist groups operating in the country, a situation that endangers the safe return of Syrian citizens who were forced from their homes due to the Western-imposed conflict. And we've come to the end of this news brief. Remember, you can find these and many other stories on our website at tellysoenglish.net. You can also follow us on social media for all the latest news. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and Telegram. For Tellysoenglish, I'm Katrina Goss and thank you for watching.